Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Angie. And I am Noel. And today we have a special guest with us. Everybody say hello to Kevin O'Shea. Hey, guys. Today's episode is the film adaptation of the musical The Wiz. And I believe Noel has some production notes for us before we get started. Yeah, just because there's so much to the history of this, I'm going to be saving a large chunk of my production notes till a little later. But this all started with the 1900 novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. I'm sure we've all heard of it. Yes. And also very loosely based on the 1939 musical, The Wizard of Oz, which was Mm -hmm. then adapted in 1974 to a off-Broadway show that soon went to Broadway in 1975 called The Wiz which was then turned into this film. And the reason we're covering on Schumacast, Joel Schumacher wrote the screenplay. And this is his fourth produced screenplay, I believe, from what we've gotten through. That sounds right. The director is Sidney Lumet. Now, have either of you ever heard of Sidney Lumet before? Does no. not ring a bell. Sidney Lumet got his start in TV back in the 1560s. He quickly made a name for himself in those anthology programs where they would adapt stage plays. Hmm. And uh. he directed an original one-hour teleplay known as 12 Angry Men. Oh, okay. And then that one-hour teleplay was expanded into a full-on play, which became a massive hit. And then he came back and directed the film adaptation of 12 (laughs) Angry Men. And just one of the legendary directors of especially the 70s and 80s, known for a lot of very tight character drums, did a lot of films based on plays, a lot based on novels, but some of his other works, The Hill, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon, the 1970s Murder on the Orient Express, Network, and The Verdict. Right around this time in his career, a lot of his stuff is kind of very simple, like small cast, very closed room drama type stuff. He was starting to kind of experiment with some different styles here in the 70s. And the film that he did right before this was a very avant-garde adaptation of the famous controversial play Equus, Mm. the one where the guy falls in love with the horse. Yeah. How do you make that into a film? Well, first you get Daniel Radcliffe. Right. Who I don't think was around in 1977. (laughs) Not born yet, no. (laughs) There must always be a Daniel Radcliffe. He should be the new Highlander. (laughs) The Wiz was his first attempt at doing a gigantic sprawling musical that he had never done anything of this style before. Mm, Okay. I think that's worth pointing out. A little bit. But we'll get into some more like history behind the film and some of the other people involved as we go along in conversation. Mm -hmm. I want to bring that up. But I also just want to really quickly go around the room. And Angie, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum? Yes, I think at least twice. My main thought with the original book, and I know it's for kids, but Baum really beats it over your head that the scarecrow already has a brain, the tin man already has a heart, and the lion already has courage. I remember just as an adult going, my God, could you make it any more obvious? (laughs) But it's a very cute little charming book otherwise. Have you ever seen, I know this is an obscure one, so probably not. Have you ever seen the 1939 musical The Wizard of Oz? Only every year on television (laughs) growing up. Had you ever seen any stagings of The Wiz? No. Had you ever seen this film version of The Wiz before? I had not. Kevin, have you ever read The Wonderful Wizard of Oz? Yes, uh, a couple times, actually. Not as a child, but I read it once in high school as Mm. part of... We had a combined U.S. history and American literature program called American Studies, and it Mm. was like the first year that our high school was doing it. Other high schools had done it previously. The periods of time when we were studying in history, we were reading stuff in the literature portion. Mm. Yeah, that's a really great idea. Yeah. It worked really well. So when we got to the Depression, this came up. It wasn't assigned to us. We just watched the movie, but I went and read it then, and then I read it again recently as an adult. And had you ever seen the 1939 musical, The Wizard of Oz? I think he just spoiled that. I think everybody, well, I actually do have a funny story about that as well. 
So my dad, they only ever had a black and white television in their house for a very long time. So in the 60s, they were showing the movie on TV every year still, just like they do these days. And so he grew up watching it. And it wasn't until he took a film class in college where they showed the movie and they were going through like the film studies and the history and the cinematography. And he was like, oh, yeah, I've seen this movie. And then they go to Oz and all of a sudden it's in color. <laughs> which was <laughs> the big thing in the 30s. Right. My life has been a lie. Yeah, he thought it was a black and white movie <laughs> all the way up until that point, and he was blown away. So he actually had the 1939 cinema goer experience wow. in 1970, whatever. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> now, have you ever seen any stagings of The Wiz before? No stagings, no. I meant to catch the live broadcast when they're doing the musicals live on NBC. And have you ever seen this film before? Only once before now. When I was very young with my family, actually, I think before Thanksgiving, it was on TV. And we were up in my grandparents' house in Waukegan where we were watching that. And everyone was like, look, it's Michael Jackson. Look, it's Diana Ross. And I was like, this isn't The Wizard of Oz. And they're like, yes, it is. <laughs> that was the last time I'd seen it up until today. Yeah, and I've not only read The Wizard of Oz, I think it was like in my early 20s when I did. I own the entirety of L. Frank Baum's Oz run and like mm -hmm. read half of it. I still have the rest of it sitting around. I just never finished it. Funnily enough, Kevin, you have a former roommate who I know is a huge fan of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and me and her actually at one point were in talks about doing a podcast series going through the entirety of L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz series. Mm -hmm. Never came about. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't grab her for this episode. I'm now surprised that I didn't either. <laughs> you didn't even think about that until now. We Tessa, I'll make it up you. to you. Sorry. <laughs> no, Tessa's always been a huge fan of that. Also, a few years ago, she was a part of a very short-lived theater company that I ran, and she was working on adapting Return to Oz mm. for a stage production. That never panned out. And of course, I've seen the 1939 musical. That's one of those, like, getting vaccinated at birth, you know? It's just annual injections. Yeah. Do they <laughs> still show it on TV, though? They do. It's on TMC, like, all the time. All right, because I'm just curious if kids today are being exposed to it in the same way we were or not. Some things are kind of fading. Well, it's on streaming, but they also show it on, like, the broadcast TV channels around the holidays. Okay. And it's on TMC or AMC. Well, that's good. So I'm sure that in family settings, it's still playing. All the time. Interestingly enough, my wife has never seen it. I'm also thinking, why didn't we have her on for this episode? <laughs> <laughs> First impressions. That's pretty tough. Just to wrap this up, I have not seen any stagings of The Wiz. I know my school actually did do a staging of it, but God, I only want to say I saw like two of their plays over the four years I was there. I will point out, though, that the majority of the adaptations that are on YouTube are like high school and middle school adaptations. Makes sense. Much simpler stagings. So the full experience. Probably the most elaborately staged one is an all-white cast in Ireland. I'll just leave that there. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I actually did want to publicly state that I am aware that we are fairly white people discussing yes. this movie. So that is the cognizant part of this discussion. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And I have seen the film, like, I don't know that I ever watched it in full. I know I saw parts of it as a child. I know I spent years being traumatized with nightmares by parts of it that I saw as a child. Oh, God. Oh, boy. We'll get there, yeah. but yes. <laughs> and, like, I know I've seen bits and snatches of it over the years, but I think this might be the first time I've sat down to actually watch the entire thing front to back. Otherwise, that's all I've got up front. So, Angie, you want to give us your detailed and elaborate <laughs> synopsis? <laughs> yeah. Before we started recording, as a matter of fact, I believe when I initially sat down to watch the film, I got about 18 minutes in and I messaged Noel, do I have to write a synopsis for this? Because this is literally just The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and as we were kind of discussing before this, we all have quite a bit of familiarity with it at this point. The main differences are the settings. Dorothy is a 24-year-old from Harlem. She gets caught up in a snowstorm in New York City. The munchkins are originally graffiti when she meets them. There's little details like that, but yeah. otherwise the plot is exactly the same as The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. We'll go into the various differences as we do them. An adaptation of the book rather than an adaptation of the movie because no. I think Warner Brothers still had a no. huge strangle horde. Well, here's... Okay, just to get into that, and this goes back to the original play without getting into mm -hmm. it fully, because I'll do that later. 
The play is basically the 1939 musical. It follows the exact same structure, even though it can't use the same music or original ideas like, say, the Ruby Slippers and all stuff. Because I know they had a really tight stranglehold on adaptations of, of yeah. that. So there's like a couple elements that they had to go back to the book on. But even the original stage play is still basically the 1939 musical in structure. Right. Because that's one thing like I always remember with the book is that there's that whole like village of ceramic people. Mm-hmm that no adaptations ever seem to reference because the 1939 musical left it out, basically. Oh, yeah, like in the book, the wizard taking off with the balloon, that's the middle point of the book. And then Mm -hmm. she has to go on a whole nother quest to find the Witch of the North. Yeah. They're still following the movie. I feel like it's kind of like Frankenstein in that not everybody is obviously remaking the 1930s film, but nearly every single time you see the monster, they're referencing that monster. They're referencing Igor. They're referencing all those things that aren't in the book, basically. A book where the monster is not stitched together from body parts, every single adaptation he stitched together from body parts because of that one. Yep. Even the Kenneth Bernal one, which is the closest to the book that I've ever seen, still had that. Yeah, it's weird. Anyway, so yeah, this is The Wizard of Oz in terms of plot. So, Noel, do you recommend this movie? I do. I do recommend it. I have one major problem with this movie. And that's the pacing. Mm. I think everything is drawn out just a little too long. Every song is like one verse too long. Most of the scenes are like an extra minute or two too long. Everything it just draws out too much. So that there's like chunks of the movie where it's like, this is great, but please get on with it. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I love the cast. I love this interpretation of the story. The songs, while very simplistic, are very catchy and very fun at times. The staging of the songs is very clever and inventive. The sets and costumes and makeup are stunning. Some of the mad effects are just gorgeous. I think it is an incredibly well-made movie. It's very fun, very striking, still holds up as very inventive to this day. It's just the pacing. It just drags at times. Even though there's scenes where like hundreds of people are dancing and spinning and it's full of energy, it's still like, we get it. Come on. Come on. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like I was watching this with a group of friends and as each scene started, our eyes were just kind of lighting up. It's like, oh, oh, hey, that's new. That's clever. That's inventive. And like by the end of the scene, we're just like, oh, please tell me we're cutting away. Yeah. That is its major <laughs> flaw. And it's significant because it's throughout the entire movie. Mm-hmm. But I still really, really like everything else. I think everything else is really top notch. I just wish it had been directed more tightly. Kevin, do you recommend this movie? Actually, exactly. The same notes as <laughs> Noel. The big prominent in my notes is pacing, capital letters. Like I said, last time I watched this was at my grandparents' house with like all my family there. And actually, the very beginning of the movie where everybody's sitting down for, I want to say that's Christmas dinner. It's Thanksgiving. It's holiday dinner. Mm-hmm. That was my childhood going up to my grandparents' house smaller house, huge family, everybody piling in using every possible square inch of that table. That's what it felt like. It was very, very nostalgic for me. I really like how inventive this adaptation got, bringing the setting from a rural setting to an urban, and by urban I literally mean in the city, mm-hmm. and specifically New York City. I really liked that visual dynamic where they're going along Yellow Brick Road in place of the city of Oz. The skyline of Oz was five Chrysler buildings. That was so cool. Just visually stunning. I really, really liked the music, the feeling. It's terrifying. And when I say it's terrifying, I mean that in a good way, because the 1939 original was also terrifying as a kid. I Mm -hmm. think there's a lot of people who point towards the flying monkey scenes as being especially traumatic for their childhood. And there were a lot of similar in this movie. (laughs) So they definitely kept that feel going. (laughs) So this isn't going to be a surprise, probably, for anyone who knows me and has listened to me enough. You love the pacing? Pacing is always a big problem for me, and it's a big contribution to why I ultimately can't recommend the movie. I wanted to love it. I really did. I love reimaginings of fairy tales and other classic stories. I love seeing different adaptations and how they treat them. I love how, you know, you can move things into different settings. I grew up listening to Motown music and I really love that style. But for me, the pacing was too slow. Honestly, with the exception of a few songs, I didn't really care for most of the songs in this. 
I couldn't get into it. I know I'm not a big fan of dance pieces, too, which is probably a big part of the problem. That whole Emerald City scene was just like, oh, my God, get on with it. You're not alone in that. (laughs) By the way, that song is not from the musical. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. (laughs) See, I grew up with Gene Kelly movies, and there's always a place right in the middle of a Gene Kelly movie where everything stops just so Gene Kelly can have a dance number. So I'm used to that. Sure. I fell in love with Hamilton like everybody else, (laughs) but I'm largely a musical noob and I'm learning that there are some aspects of the classical musical style that don't necessarily appeal to me personally. It doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that I don't Mm. care for them. So had this been an hour and 45 minutes, say, and not two hours and 15 minutes, I might have felt a little differently. But because of the pacing and a lot of the stuff, I was just like, you know, I want to love it, but I just can't. I just can't. And I don't feel good recommending it to other people. If I was sitting there going, oh, my God, just end, please. (laughs) Yeah. And if I could just pick up on that note before we move on. The unfortunate thing is that, you know, as I'm watching, I'm trying to think, are there ways you could tighten this up and trim it and all stuff? The problem Mm -hmm. is the way the scenes are built, you can't really just go in and cut them down. They're basically setting up those dance moments. You would have to go in and restage them. They are set up to draw out. And it's like you would need to go back in and completely reset them up in order to make them move faster. But I mean, Mm -hmm. so many of the scenes were verse of the song, verse of the song, pause for an elaborate dance sequence, (laughs) one more full verse of the song. So it's like some of these musical numbers will go on for five full minutes. Yeah. I can understand maybe one or two doing that. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have so many where it's like a full song, two lines of dialogue. Here's another full song. I think there yeah. needed to be a little more thought in how they structured some of that out. I wonder mm-hmm. if they were pulling on old Gene Kelly movies where that's how a lot of those went. You had a lot of stuff to set up the elaborate dance sequences that could frequently go very, very long. Yeah, but if you even look at Singing in the Rain, though, there's three elaborate dance sequences. There's several songs. Some of them are short songs. Some of them are long songs. The songs are still used to tell a story. With the exception of, like, singing in the rain to make them laugh. They're still thinking about it in the mechanics of storytelling. Yeah, but then there's also things like On the Town or The Pirate, where there are elaborate dance sequences that are literally just there so Gene Kelly can have a dance sequence and they have absolutely nothing else to do with the movie. And there's reason why those are considered lesser works. (laughs) I'm not disagreeing (laughs) with you on that. I'm just saying. Not all classic musicals are considered classics. That's, like, just the one element where I'm like... I love everything that they're putting together in this movie, but how they're putting it together, I can see why it's a movie that had a very mixed reaction ever since it came out. Yeah. Because it's not the easiest to just sit down and watch. There's Mm -hmm. also, speaking of not the easiest to sit down and watch, going to address the elephant in the room, especially since we know that the screenplay was written by a white person. I have to wonder how much of that iconography was written by a white person for black actors to dress up and sing in. If it was intentional, like if they were fine with that, then that's one thing. But if it was just like, hey, white writer, let's have all these black actors sing and dance like crows. That's like Song of the South kind of awkward. Yeah, the crow part was a bit. Yeah, (laughs) I know a lot of the musical numbers Quincy Jones had a lot of input on. Yes, the musical number is not a problem. Mm -hmm. The thing is, the original play of The Wiz, William F. Brown, who wrote the original play, is a white man. Yeah, so it's one of those questions where watching it and not knowing the history of this is like, we had the same kind of conversation for Big Trouble in Little China. It was like, is this actually racist? We're not entirely certain. I hesitate to call it because it was done with a significant amount of input from the black creators who were also involved in it. And I should point out, Joel Schumacher, this is not him just bringing this all from his head. He even mentions he did this for the hell of doing it and was basically just putting down ideas that were coming from other people to him left and right. So he was basically just the person who was there to just kind of gather together all the ideas. You may have this in your notes, Noel, but I was just looking on Wikipedia and I noticed that it seemed like the original play, Dorothy's still from Kansas. Like there's a lot of different elements that whether it was Joel or other people directing him or whatever, like the film seemed to make a little bit more effort to actually make it more relevant to a black community than even the original play did. I'll go ahead and bring that up then. Yeah, the original sure. play is basically just a very basic adaptation of Wizard of Oz. Mm-hmm. Just some jive slang thrown in, but it's otherwise a pretty basic adaptation. Basically just a way to get some new musicals and throw some comedy numbers in there. There's not much to it. There's like no depth to it at all. And again, mm-hmm. it's little girl from Kansas gets swept away to Oz. 
all of the whole New York and urban angles and a lot of the themes about don't listen to others, believe in yourself, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's all original to this movie. Mm -hmm. This is literally a completely different thing than the play. It has the same songs and the basic same story, but it goes off in a completely different direction with them. Though they did swap out some songs as well, right? I know the Emerald City song is original to this. I seem to recall the Scarecrow song is different. The Scarecrow one, okay, the play originated in Baltimore before it went to Broadway. Mm -hmm. The song that he sings in this movie is from that original Baltimore version, but then they replaced it with a new version when it went to Broadway. Okay. So this is a very interesting thing. And to Kevin's point, we're all white people evaluating a film written by a white guy, directed by a white guy, produced by white people, a lot of things, and based on a play that was written by a white guy. But it was a play that was actually directed, choreographed, designed by black people and Mm -hmm. starred black people. So it does kind of bring up Big Trouble in Little China is that while it has its origins of white people, I think black people did very much help shape it. Mm -hmm. So I think if there was anything objectionable, I think they would have helped to smooth over that. It's Mm -hmm. definitely a discussion worth having, though. But yeah, so Angie, where would you like to take us from here? I guess we can go ahead and start getting into the film itself Mm -hmm. and start into discussion. So I know like we already somewhat, like Kevin, you had brought up the sequence with Dorothy and her family in the very beginning there. I did think that was a really interesting counterpoint compared to, you know, because in the book and in the original film, it's just Dorothy and Auntie Em and Uncle Henry. And here you've got this huge family that's surrounding her and yet she's still very much alone. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely very sad. You really related, I think, to her in a lot of ways. At least maybe that's just me as an introvert with anxiety issues. That (laughs) feeling of like... Oh, God, so many people here, and yet I don't... It's very relatable. So many people here, I'm going to hide in the kitchen and do my own thing. Right. How often does your aunt try to set you up with a guy? (laughs) Hopefully less now than before. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Grandma tried to set me up with the bus boy one Thanksgiving. That was fun. (laughs) Let me tell you. Hashtag relatable. He's a driver. (laughs) He's got a bus. Yeah. (laughs) But while I do kind of think Diana Ross looks a little too old for 24 in this film, I do have to say, otherwise I do really like her as Dorothy and I found her pretty relatable. I like her as a teacher who's not entirely certain what to do with her life. And that's where a lot of the driving conflict is. It's not necessarily her Mm -hmm. trying to get back to her family. It's her trying to figure out what her life is and figure out what she wants with her life. And thus the conflict coming to what I want with my life is to go home and Mm -hmm. be with that family. And that I thought was a nice touch. That's actually one of the interesting things is, okay, have either of you ever heard of Werner Erhard and the Erhard Seminars training? Wikipedia mentioned it, so I was looking at it, but I had never heard of it before today. (laughs) Just looking it up, it was just basically a self-help workshop that people would go and do on weekends. And the big theme of it is misery a lot comes from feeling like you have to live up to other people's expectations of what your life should be instead of just wanting to be who you are and trying to seek out your own goals. Mm -hmm. Joel Schumacher and Diana Ross were very big proponents of Werner Erhard, and they intentionally kind of worked elements of that into the script. And I know some people have criticized it because, yeah, there are a lot of platitudes about don't let negative thinking bring you down, you know, or don't let other people tell you what you can't do and all that type of stuff. But to be fair, I actually think it's a really nice thematic arc to build a lot of the characters on. Absolutely. And it kind of ties back to the books, right? Because kinda, yeah. the Scarecrow didn't need a brain. It was in him all along. Like, it's a similar kind of thing. Like, all they had to do was believe in themselves and realize they already had these things. It's a different take on the same concept. Yeah. Right. You know how to live your life. Other people are telling you that you can't do it because of such and such thing, and you end up believing them because you keep hearing Mm -hmm. them say that. So you believe you don't have a brain, even though you're filled to the brim with Mm -hmm. quotations. Right. And I like how they took that element that's common to those three characters in the book and now kind of applied it to Dorothy. Yeah. In that it's a harsh difference between the stark, desolate wastelands in Kansas to Mm -hmm. surrounded by an entire family that you don't know how to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Because everywhere you go, they're trying to tell you who to be with. I love being a teacher. These little kids, no, you want to go to a high school. They pay more, you know? Mm -hmm. Everyone's just constantly telling you what to do with your life. I actually really like that. Mm -hmm. And then on Diana Ross, when they started doing this movie, they were going to keep it as a, a girl in Kansas. And they were looking at Stephanie Mills, who starred in the Broadway play to potentially star. She was like 19, 20 at the time, but she was basically like Judy Garland to get someone a little older to still play young. Mm -hmm. Or they were actually starting to audition around to young girls. 
And then Diana Ross basically just swept in and was like, oh, I want to do it. 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 So they rebuilt this role for her. I think it's stretching a little bit to write her down as 24. I think she was 33 at the time. Yeah. But when Diana Ross comes in and says, I want to do this, you do it. To be fair, and we'll get into that, that actually created a lot of problems. Well, yeah. But she did help them get a lot of funding in order to make the movie. Well, she helped them replace a lot of funding that pulled out. (laughs) (laughs) But to be fair, I really like her performance. I know a lot of people were critical of it. Well, you expect us to believe this beautiful pop diva is going to be a 30-year-old spinster school teacher. And it's like, I think she really does do a really good performance of that. Yes. I think part of it is is that our generation is more separated from the in the moment of the 70s where Diana Ross was still a major, major star and glamorous mm-hmm. diva all over the place. I mean, it's like nowadays, if you decide to get Nicki Minaj to play, you know, Rebecca Sunnybrook Farm. Oh, to be fair, Nicki Minaj would kill it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of people who would just be struggling to wrap their head around that, you know? Right. <laughs> but no, I like it. I like how simple her outfit is. And I'm going to say this throughout the entire movie. There's so much emotion in this movie. Absolutely. And there's so much that she just knocks out and even though it goes on way too long that whole end song where she's just pouring all the emotion out as she looks straight into the camera it's like she was a really good and it's hard to believe this is only her third movie Mm. this is only the third movie that she's acted in and this is her last movie she stopped making movies after this and that's a shame because i think she was a genuine talent and she's still around maybe she'll make another one yeah she's a fantastic singer there's no doubt about that i think it worked really well and i felt so bad for those two old guys who dropped the checkerboard yeah (laughs) <laughs> they just wanted to keep that game going. That literally was my grandparents' house <laughs> on Thanksgivings and Christmases and Easter <laughs> and so many people, you know, playing checkers, playing Parcheesi in whatever counter space, tabletop space that we could get and then having to quickly <laughs> clear it away because food's coming. As I had said earlier, instead of a tornado, it's actually a snowstorm. A tornado within a snowstorm, sort of. Yeah, a tornado <laughs> within a snowstorm that is apparently created by Glenda the Good Witch. Because, I don't know. Dorothy needed to learn. Yeah. She's brought to the land of the munchkins, which in this case is a graffiti-covered playground, which I thought was a pretty awesome set piece, and the way they all kind of came out of the walls like that was quite something. Oh, God, that's terrifying. I love how it's terrifying until they start speaking, because, yeah, yeah, they're literally the graffiti on the walls, and they're literally ripping their cells off and lurching forward. And she said, Toto, so they're just all ripping, Toto. Toto, 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 as they're like all lurching towards her. (laughs) I guess that's the thing about seeing this as an adult, that it wasn't creepy at all to me, but I can see as a kid that would be pretty scary. When I saw this as a kid, that part wrecked my shit. When I saw it last week, it was creepy. As an adult, (laughs) having recently read stuff by Junji Ito, I was like, okay, that's, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Graffiti is shaped like me, it's my hole. (laughs) To reverse Junji Ito. (laughs) There's three people that I really want to bring up here as we're getting into Oz as a whole. Mm. Tony Walton, who's the set and costume designer. He's the guy who did Mary Poppins. That makes sense. And a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. That makes a lot of sense because both of those had a lot of set cohesion. Yeah, he's one of the few who does both sets and costumes. Yeah, so just keeping everything into a whole big visual dynamic whole. I can definitely see how that was the same person. And Stan Winston did all of the makeup effects. What's interesting about him is his first major thing leading up to this was he did all the old age makeup in Roots. Mm. I'm guessing that must have led to this because it's literally like right after this is when he starts getting all of his, you know, Friday the 13th Part 2, then The Thing, and then Starman, and then it just takes off from there. So yeah, this is like early just breaking out Stan Winston doing all the makeup effects. Okay. And then Albert Whitlock, who did all the matte effects, like he did all the massive matte paintings and all the miniature work and all that stuff. He is like one of those legends who, if you go from the 1950s up to the end of the 80s, if you see a matte painting in the movie, it's a 50-50 odds it was Albert Whitlock. (laughs) He was one of those guys. He did tons of stuff. And some of his most prominent ones, like he did the birds. He did Mm. all the visual effects for the birds. (laughs) It's like, I'm not even going to read off his list because it's like everything. Yeah. This was one of his major films where he was not just doing matte paintings, but he was supervising all the effects. So I just want to point out those three are the ones who are primarily responsible for like everything we see. But what's interesting is that with the Munchkin Village, if you had told me that was not by the same guy who directed Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, I would be shocked. (laughs) Because it's all neon and black lights, crazy detailed costumes. (laughs) That's true. It's missing the giant nipple statues, which is the Joel Schumacher standard. (laughs) 
Kevin, we never asked you. What do you think about Joel Schumacher? I think he's done some good things and some bad things because I know him, yeah, sure, as Batman and Forever and Batman and Robin, but I also know him as Lost Boys. I can understand where when he gets right, he gets very right. And when he gets wrong, he gets very wrong. But you can say that about a lot of people. So I am cautiously neutral on Joel Schumacher just in general. Well, I hope you enjoy the show. (laughs) (laughs) But one thing I mentioned is as I was watching this, I'm like, oh, my God, there's so many parallels between this and like the next time Joel. Because Joel, you know, we talked about how he's more kind of lean, buttoned down, very clean, crisp movies. And then he'll occasionally just have these massive spectacles that go way over the top. That's where I just kept thinking of the Batman movies as I'm watching this. But then to actually go back and find out, he really didn't have anything to do with that side of this thing. He just was kind of there putting everything on paper. I just found that just an interesting, almost like an early view of something that's not actually him. Well, I guess since he grew up in New York City, I imagine that some degree that's the parallel there. That yeah. he was at least thinking about those things probably when he wrote them down. And then the people who went to actually design the movie picked up on that. Or who knows, maybe he was inspired by this movie when he went on to later things. Maybe so. Anyways, anything else we want to mention about the Munchkins or Miss One? I liked how she had just everything about her and the Munchkins themselves all shared that whole numbers motif. She had the abacus necklace. The numbers sewed in her hair. The numbers yeah. sewed in her hair. <laughs> yeah. All of the Munchkins were wearing numbers. Everything all together, like we mentioned before, just thematic visual cohesion. Mm-hmm. But this is where we really get into the start of, it's like a really, really well-produced musical number. But it's like there's entire chunks of it that I wish you had chosen one of these moments instead of showing me all five. (laughs) Yeah. Like the bit where they all run up and throw their hats in the air or the bit where they're standing there and suddenly they have hula hoops. Pick one. I don't need to see them all. Mm Mm-hmm. I liked the visual look of it, but I didn't care for the scene too much because I was just getting kind of bored with it. I did like the alleyway playground set design. That was really neat as like the beginning of her adventure. I kept trying to see if the playground equipment was trying to spell something. I was at that point, I was so tired with the dance sequence that I'm like, are they trying to subtly spell something out? Am I supposed to be picking up on something? It's spelling yourself. (laughs) What is it now? That, that's it's all. It's spelling Angie. <laughs> but you've always been here. Again, I love the look of the movie. You know, Road Warrior and that kind of ilk gets a lot of credit for that very ultra detailed scraps, bits and pieces style of design. Mm-hmm. This was two years before even Mad Max came out. And it's just the amount of stuff that's going on. I also do want to also just quickly mention the cinematographer is the same guy who did the Dark Crystal, the Jim Henson movie. Hmm, that also okay. makes sense. Oh, um, pointing her to the yellow brick road leads her to these yellow cabs that keep popping up, but then always throwing on the mm. off duty sign and driving away whenever she gets near them. That was one thing in the screenplay. They did explain that where she's kind of intentionally being sabotaged along the way. And these mm-hmm. guys are related to like the guy that we'll meet in the subway and how there is this kind of active effort to keep her from getting to the Wizard of Oz that's being instituted by, I can't remember which one is the Wicked Witch of the West, if that's Eveline or the other one. Eveline. Yeah, Eveline, the Wicked Witch of the West. This is all organized by her. And that's why when we cut to her place in the end, we're going to see a lot of these supporting characters like the poppy dancers and the crows mm. because she is trying to stop Dorothy going on this route. So I don't know quite why they cut that explanation, but I kind of like that there's just more whimsy to it without. Yeah, I don't think you necessarily need an explanation for it. It's just, it's difficult. Right. It also fits thematically into the concept of other people can't live your life for you. You have to make your own decisions. So it Mm -hmm. kind of is more of a physical representation of that, where it's literally other people can't drive you to the Emerald City. You have to get there yourself. Yeah. Right. And you still kind of see that through the movie where before he attacks them in the subway, you do see the guy with the marionettes following Mm -hmm. them along the way you know, like he's looking at him through a telescope and all that stuff. So that is like that same character. But then they never really go anywhere with that beyond the attack. Right. But even then, it's kind of an interesting thing of just this weird guy starts following them and then attacks them. Even mm-hmm. that just has this kind of nice nightmare quality. Scarecrow and the crows are next. Enter Michael Jackson, which I feel like is one of the main reasons you're probably watching this movie if you... God, he <laughs> was so young. I know, huh? He was literally still a teenager at the time. Oh, uh, I said earlier, God, he was such a baby back then. It was like, wow. 
I just want to hold him close. Just save him from everything that's coming. <laughs> well, this is the film that led him to break up with his dad. That's good. Because his dad tried to block him from doing this. And mm. this is what led him to fire his dad as his manager and go off on his own. And Quincy Jones was the music producer in this movie. And this is where the two of them met. And then Quincy Jones produced his next three albums. Nobody can tell you how to live your life except for you. Including Thriller <laughs> and Bad. So, I mean, it's like this was like one of those massive instigators of pop culture. If this film hadn't happened, Michael Jackson's life and career would have gone for better and ill mm -hmm. would have been a completely different life and career. Right. But, you know, even just that aside, isn't he sweet? He is. I like that he was a scarecrow made out of garbage. So he had all of those fortune cookie wrappers uh -huh. and how his nose where in 1939, it was like a painted circle on his nose. Like it was a Reese's cup wrapper. I thought that was really cute. Right. And what I love is that in close ups, as he's breathing, you see the wrapper like blowing. <laughs> So no, it's like it's literally not. a wrap. It's not designed to look like a wrapper. It, no, Stan Winston just put a Reese's peanut butter cup on Michael Jackson's nose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way he moves, which I mean, mm -hmm. big surprise, Michael Jackson yeah. knows how to move, but he really does make it look like he's just made of stuffing. You know? He has yeah. no bones. That whole boneless walk and everything, he's mm -hmm. flopping around. And that's what I like is that, you know, other than those spins, which are so iconically Michael Jackson, he really made this a character. It's not Michael Jackson's The Scarecrow. It's The Scarecrow. He really yeah. made a, a fully developed character out of it and is right. like fully committed to that character. It was all the better for it. And apparently mm -hmm. he just took this role super seriously and just loved doing it. Not surprising. I do really like the song, You Can't Win. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just so heartbreaking. These crows are just constantly taunting a scarecrow into submission. That song and then the traveling song that followed, those were some of my favorite songs. And yeah. I thought those were really good sequences. Ease on Down the Road is, like I said, I, I wasn't crazy about a lot of the songs, but that one's fantastic. That's a really good song. Yeah. It's so catchy. Too. Well, and the thing about all the songs... To be fair, it's kind of hard to talk about the songs in this movie because the songs are kind of the original songs. Some of the mm -hmm. songs were expanded by Quincy Jones and have like extra verses added to them that weren't part of the originals. The songs are so simple that I think that's also what hurts the fact that the musical numbers go on for so long because you're just kind of repeating the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, that was kind of always the problem I had with who, who's the guy who did Pirates of Penzance? Gilbert and Sullivan. I watched the one with Kevin Klein, And it's like you're taking a great two minutes of music and you're expanding it to six by just repeating the same damn things over and over and over again. To be fair... That's Gilbert and Sullivan. Everything they do is like that. To be fair, Pirates mm. of Penzance would have been a great 45-minute movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I like how the lyrics, Ease On Down the Road, became part of the set design, where the bridge had Ease On written on it. Mm -hmm. When they got stopped in front of the library, there was this don't walk sign that says don't ease. Yeah. Right. Just making that just, I'm going to use the word cohesiveness again, but because that's really what it was, it just brought everything together. I just thought that was really a neat aspect of that. Mm -hmm. And again, Albert Whitlock's beautiful mat work, that whole skyline of the five Chrysler, five buildings, Chrysler the, buildings, the yellow brick road <laughs> leading over the bridge to it. It didn't look like a mat backdrop. It looked like they were literally mm -hmm. panning to a city that had five Chrysler buildings. There's a reason why he was one of the major go-to effects guys. For yeah. Because sometimes you can tell when it's a mat backdrop. While obviously there's no skyline that has five Chrysler buildings in it, it holds up even to this day. And then also, I know this is from later in the movie, but just to tie it together, there's that other scene where they're heading towards the Emerald City and you have that whole shot of this gigantic yellow brick road bridge just kind of winding in and out of buildings and into the city. I just love the urban whimsy of it. Like, mm. This is an urban mm -hmm. fantasy movie. It is. Yes. Like a full on, let's use a modern day cityscape for a fairy tale. I mean, to the point where, not the most successful effect, but I love that when the sun rises, it's literally the Big Apple. Yeah. <laughs> the striking images. And the scale. That's one of the things that I love the most about this movie is the scale. It feels big. It feels like a world. And again, they shot most of this in New York. We'll get to the Emerald City, which is literally at the base of the World Trade Center. Mm. Everything is huge in this movie. <laughs> With the exception of the Poppy Village tube. It was a very short tube. Very brisk. Next is where they meet Nipsey Russell as the Tin Man. At the real carnival on the docks. Yes. I really liked that detail that he was at the carnival. Yeah, that he's basically a carnival barker automaton. Made out of various junk. Yeah, that's just been cobbled together. Mm -hmm. Still stuck under the weight of his ex-wife, Teeny. I like how the yellow brick road became part of the roller coaster. Yeah, that was a nice little detail too. Oh, I didn't notice yeah. that. Yep. Everyone always talks about Michael Jackson and Diana Ross with this, but oh, I love Nipsey Russell. Mm -hmm. 
And again, the emotion, because, you know, he's the guy without a heart who's genuinely caring about everything. He really sells that really well. Mm-hmm. With the exception of when he's crying. Eh-he, eh-he. <laughs> <laughs> a little too much of his comedic acting coming through there, I think. And, and the squirt gun tears spraying from his eyes. And- I didn't have a problem with that because, again, thematically, it fit with the absurdity of the rest of the world. Yeah. No, it was funny. I just, I hate to say this, I kept thinking of turtles having sex. What? <laughs> and this is how you know it's a null podcast. <laughs> I'm not trying to go blue. It's like, literally, I just couldn't stop thinking of a turtle okay. going, oh, oh. <laughs> I guess I've never seen turtles have sex to make that comparison. Again, just the wonderful performance. And again, he's not like a swindler carnival barker. Mm-mm. He's, again, the kind of fantasy of like, let's look at all the wonder in the world type of thing, you know? Yeah. And just the outfit. That is just one of the best costume designs I've ever seen. It really is. Mm-hmm. The pot pants. And like the popcorn tin or the whatever tin it was as part of his leg. Mm-hmm. The bow tie made out of stuff. Yeah. Whatever that was, yeah. See, and again, in the play, he was just the tin woodsman. And they mm-hmm. had the whole backstory of, you know, the witch cursed my axe and I cut off my leg and suddenly I was made out right. of tin, you know. And this is just such a completely different take on the character. And yet I think it really works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really good choice. And again, that he is so dedicated to this life that's now been abandoned. He's literally just junk that's been left behind. That he still cares Mm -hmm. about. No, it's weird because I liked him a lot, but I find I don't have a whole lot to say except I really liked him. (laughs) This sequence was really more of a transition to get to the next one. Well, I think Nipsey, this character kind of feels older than the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has that sense of someone who's been left behind. I would say the scarecrow was the youth. Dorothy is the 20s. And the lion Mm -hmm. is kind of the raging, impotent middle age. And this guy is the old timer who's just being forgotten and left behind. He's got all these stories and all this experience, but just no one cares him anymore until these people come along and treat him like he matters. Mm -hmm. I never really thought of that before, but there is this kind of generational aspect to the group. Yeah, stages of life. The stages of life where people keep telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. On that note, do we want to get to the impotent middle age? (laughs) Right. On on to the lion who's hiding out as a lion statue in front of the library, which Mm -hmm. I thought was a fun little touch. That was also really clever. I liked that. Yeah. That was great. And... I love not only the whole fur outfit and the giant mane, but I love that his paw <laughs> boots have heels. <laughs> Just these big platform heel paws. <laughs> <laughs> and I should mention, that's Ted Ross, who not only played the lion in the Broadway show, him and the actress playing Eveline are the only actors from the Broadway show. He mm-hmm. won the Tony for this performance. Okay. That was a good performance. I mean, I think it comes down to not caring for the songs as much, I guess, Mm. because it was fine. I just didn't... You didn't think he was a mean old lion? I don't know. I just wasn't getting into it, I guess. This is one of the weaker songs. I think his performance outside of the song was the strongest, and not only was it very comparable to the 1939 lion, like the put him up, put him up. (laughs) Just everything about him was just absolutely perfect. And while it was one of the weaker songs, in my opinion, it didn't really detract from his character. Yeah, and I I agree with that. What I like about his performance is that he has these nice mix of quiet moments and then going full Brian Blessed. (laughs) (laughs) And you can definitely tell this is a theater actor because he'll just belt things out. My other problem is the lion I just never found to be that interesting of a character. No, he's really not. These other people have this other stuff, but it's like he is a coward. You can't just say that people are telling him he's a coward and he's believing it. No, he is a coward. I don't say that as a criticism because it's a coward learning how to not run away when your friends are in danger. That's a good story Mm -hmm. in its own right. But his journey doesn't really fit with the other people. Not as much. His isn't really a journey of discovery so much as he's actually learning to become something new. Yeah. It's the whole maxim that true courage is acting even though you are scared, Mm -hmm. which is always Mm -hmm. applicable to any kind of situation, especially adaptations of this. But yeah, it was one of the aspects that was the least adapted to the new story. It felt like it was there just because you had to have the Cowardly Lion, but his performance was still so great that I didn't really care because then you've got, hey, it's the Cowardly Lion. You got to have the Cowardly Lion. And even just thinking back, like in the 1939 version and in the original novel, the lion is slightly the odd man out of the group just because he is coming at it from a different angle. I think it's a more difficult emotion to really portray in that kind of way. Yeah. And I think, you know, the 1939 musical just had such a performance that you didn't care. You embrace him anyways. I think even in the book, it was just such a simpler story with Mm -hmm. much simpler themes that it really didn't stand out that much. Here, as you're increasing the thematic depth of the material, 
feel the difference of his arc compared to the others stands out more. Yeah, I can agree mm-hmm. with that. I mean, it's not that I dislike the character. I just think the film treats him as though we're supposed to be enjoying him a lot more than we are. Like, he's given right. a lot more focus than even, like, the Tin Man. Whereas the Tin Man's a more interesting character. Yeah. We're enjoying him because, hey, look, it's the Cowardly Lion, as opposed to, hey, this is this character in relation to the story. And if I'm not mistaken, we have this scene of his song. We then go to the subway. And then after that, we do the poppy thing. So it's like three things in a row, all of the yeah, lion. all about him, yeah. And I mean, obviously Dorothy's in there too, but it's like, okay, enough with the lion already. Even the poppies is more about the scarecrow and the tin man being the only ones mm-hmm. who can save the day, and yet they still make it about the lion. He still right. gets his big, you're a lion song, you know? Mm-hmm. And even then, as the thing goes on, there's still a lot of focus on the lion. He stands out from the ensemble a little too much. Yeah. And to be fair, in the 1939 version, he did too. And I think that might be what's influencing this, but there they pull it off a little better. Mm. The main difference in the party companions in this as opposed to the original movie is that in the original movie, everybody was somebody from Dorothy's farm. The stuff that they go through is stuff that they had told her before. In this, the Cowardly Lion, his character arc, really is not in any way related to Dorothy, aside from the fact that he's there. The Scarecrow does, the Tin Man does, and the Lion is just, hey, everybody, it's the Cowardly Lion. I mean, you could almost say it's similar in that Dorothy learns to take charge and act Mm -hmm. as the situations go along. But even then, she's still being nudged by the other people. The thread does kind of get dropped. Yeah. What's our next segment? I guess the subway scene. The subway scene, which haunts me to this day. That was the other terrifying part (laughs) that I remember as a kid. And I remember even back then. Speaking in kid language, what a fucked up nightmare that is. (laughs) That was, I, I, I wrote here, the garbage can robots from Star Wars aren't fucking around this time. The garbage cans weren't the scary part. What was with those goddamn marionettes? (laughs) Okay, so as a kid, the garbage cans were the scariest part. As an adult, it's those fucking marionettes. But as a kid, I very, very distinctly, of the few things I remember from this movie, the garbage cans with the giant teeth, those stuck (laughs) out. And even, honestly, the pillars tearing themselves loose and just surrounding you. Subway of nightmares. (laughs) But I will say, like, even I just did a recent watching, like, a day ago. I'm like, what's a paper marionette actually going to do to you? It's just going to kind of like fold (laughs) against you. And then as I see the scene again, it's like, it might not do anything, but I'm not fucking letting that thing touch me. (laughs) What the hell? What the hell? Yeah, it may not be able to do anything, but I'm not fucking going to stand here and find out. (laughs) And it it is directed like a full on horror sequence. It is because it is. It's so cool, though. Oh, it's amazing. The way they grow. Oh, I know. It's beautifully made. I love it. It's cinematically gorgeous, that whole sequence from start to finish. Yeah. I still want them to recoup me for my childhood therapy bills, but... (laughs) But I think that was the best scene of that movie. I wish I could go back in time now and see this. I'm missing the trauma that y'all got. (laughs) No, the Nightmare Subway Station, I think, is one of the best scenes in the movie. I'm going to put that there right now. Well, and again, as I was watching this with friends, my friends were like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) But I think to kind of get to the conversation we were just having is that this is a scene that should be our first scene of seeing the entire team coming together as a team. Yeah. Right. But it's not. It's all about the lion again. Yep. I don't understand what the impulse was for that. Absolutely have it be that he's playing an important part and that he's turning around and coming back to help and, you know, is using mm-hmm. his strength and all stuff. But you should have the Tin Man, you know, using, I don't know how he, how he uses heart, but his compassion for other people. Well, yeah, showing concern or something, yeah. Even the Scarecrow being clever and mm-hmm. Dorothy having agency. Right. This is where we should get our first glimpse of our people rising to the occasion. Or, at the very least, almost rising to the occasion, but still not quite, just as a kind of, they're almost there. Instead of all these things happen and the lion roars at it and pushes it away. I mean, this is the haunted forest sequence from the 1939 movie. Yeah. In the forest sequence, do they work together? Is it mostly the lion? What happens in that? It's been a while since I watched it. You mean when the flying monkeys attack them? Yeah. 
And then you have to remember the original musical also had the bit where after Dorothy's been captured, you then have the three of these people teamed up to try to go and infiltrate the palace right. as a team. Right, right. And we didn't get that either. Yeah. No. I think they kind of ran out of steam after that point and they were just, okay, we got to end the movie now. No, because there's still a lot of movie. No, but it does feel like, okay, we've got the crew together now what? Well, and I should also point out that Sidney Lumet, while he had seen the 1939 movie, avoided watching it because he didn't want a back reference to it. He had mm-hmm. several other people who would regularly watch the movie just to tell them if they were doing anything too similar to it because he wanted to make a very different movie than that movie. So they're not going to be following okay. it beat by beat, even though the play did. Sure. But I should mention Joel Schumacher only saw the play once and otherwise did not incorporate any of the script into this. I feel like maybe they didn't quite know what to do. So it was like, well, we just introduced the lion. Let's show that he can have some bravery. You know what I mean? Like, I think they were not quite sure where to go next. And that's where, like, I love half the scene. The whole setup of all this messed up monstrous stuff coming towards them is great. Mm -hmm. And even then, there's no battle between the lion and the giant paper marionette things. They just kind of disappear after their first setup. Kind of like see them in the distance. Right. It's mostly all the pillars. It'd be great if they never stopped walking, that they were just still slowly walking after them for the entire movie. (laughs) Just terrifying everyone that they passed. They showed up for the final dance sequence. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We just wanted to dance with you. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) So next is The Poppies. Which, is this supposed to be a kid's movie? Not really. Is it not? Not really? Well, it's, to be fair, the sexiness of the poppies is something that would fly over the head of kids. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it is just interesting to see literal prostitutes. I mean, not that you see them selling themselves or anything, but... No, but it is a literal red light district. Yeah. Right, right. The giant neon lips. Yeah, this is interesting to see. (laughs) Again, you see the gate of giant neon lips closing, and it's like, so wait, this isn't directed by the guy who did Batman Forever? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) and it's like they're literally descending into a smoke-filled neon tube (laughs) and it's like really he didn't direct this okay (laughs) so i guess you're saying that wasn't described in the script either (laughs) oh it was oh it was okay i don't know how much of that was him and how much was see he had the vision yeah he could have (laughs) again i will say i read the shooting script there's like little bits here and there like i mentioned a couple little story threads here and there but this is pretty identical to what was in the script that I read. Grand, the script I read was mm-hmm. like a third draft shooting script. So okay. any other ideas and inputs that other people had would have already been incorporated by that point. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have like an early draft or anything. But yeah, the Poppy District is interesting. And again, it's like I like the setup of the scene because it's playing on the other poppy fields. Right. Even the play had the poppy field, but all the poppy flowers were represented by sexy, alluring dancers. And then, because in the original book, they were saved by field mice that came in and dragged them out of the poppy field. In the play, it was the mice squad, (laughs) where it's literally like mice in like old Bobby police uniforms coming out and be like, break it up, break it up. What are you guys doing here? (laughs) (laughs) What's funny is the all white Irish staging of the play that I watched on YouTube changed the the mice squad to Miami mice. (laughs) Okay. And yes, they were dressed like Don Johnson. Wow. So it's interesting, but again, it's like the Scarecrow and the Tin Man saved them. Mm -hmm. Let me show gratitude by making it all about Lion. Yeah, yeah. Because he has the big production of, I'm going to throw myself from the roof. Right, yeah. I think this is the point in the movie where you're at Lion Overload and you're just like, please stop. Yeah. (laughs) These were some of the scenes where I set my player at 20% accelerated speed to get through them slightly faster. Because I wasn't really missing much other than the dance sequences. And you can speed up the dance sequences and not miss anything. (laughs) I actually watched the entire movie last night again. That was like my third viewing for this on two times speed. Wow. It made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wonder why these musical numbers aren't dragging anymore. The dance sequences are now normal length dance sequences. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So what's after the poppies? Do they get to the Emerald City next? Yes, because after the poppies is when we get the whole matte painting where you see the yellow brick road winding into the city and the rising of the Big Apple and all that. Right, yeah, so they go to the Emerald City. Everything prior to this, all the aesthetic changes made a lot more sense to me as to how they related to the characters. The Emerald City, Mm -hmm. in and of itself, I didn't have a problem with, but the only thing I was slightly confused about is why the gate turned into a bank vault. Because that's where the riches live. Okay, that makes a little more sense now. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it's the high society. The gated community. The vaulted community, basically. Okay. 
Angie, did you want to tell us a bit more about what happens in Animal City? Uh, if I have to. <laughs> it's a very, very long dance sequence slash musical number to illustrate that rich people follow whatever the fashion whims they're told to follow. And it, they're very fickle. <laughs> yeah, like, it's green, it's red, it's gold. Whatever the guy says, that's what we're going to do. Especially since the very first thing they say is that they would never be red. And then all of a sudden, over the mm-hmm. lodgepeakers, is like, the color is now red. And now everyone's like, red is my favorite color. Right. I don't quite get what the thematic relevance is of green, red, gold, which are all traffic light. Yeah, I don't know if that was... I think it's more just more fickle society following the zeitgeist. Right. Maybe that's just more city imagery, too. Yeah. You know? And I think it is sort of a nice way to harken back to the idea in the book about how the Emerald City wasn't really green. It was just that everyone was forced to wear glasses that made it look green. Which is actually something they've brought back in the play. But they did not keep it here. Right. So instead, it's just he shines a big light on them, and that's how they all change colors. Yeah. In the play, it was that when the wizard came, it was he was wearing these giant green superfly glasses that became mm-hmm. like a fad, and then he convinced everyone to just leave them on, and then convinced everyone that he replaced everything with emeralds. Mm, okay. So I like the book. Yeah. I just this scene, I was just like, oh man, it drags. I know it's really bad to look at your phone while you're watching a movie, but I really want to look at my phone. It drags. <laughs> On favorite, this looks like a beautiful sequence, but mm-hmm. again, you're doing the exact same thing three times in a row. Mm-hmm. I want to say the sequence lasts like six minutes, and it's not even uh, that good of a song. It felt like an eternity. That's all I know. <laughs> and just think of all the money that was spent so they could build three different versions of each of these outfits. <laughs> No wonder this film went over budget, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. What I will say, what I genuinely love, one, again, the matte painting. as Again, this film is shot at the base of the World Trade Center, which just opened like a few years before this movie. Mm. And just that shot panning up the twin towers and the two towers are connected at the top with the giant loudspeakers and the traffic lights. That was a beautiful image. Also, the camera and microphone robot people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Hey, Mike, get over here. (laughs) This giant microphone comes wobbling up. microphone, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that was a cute little joke. Those were fun, but again, it's like the entire sequence. I I will say this sequence, I think, is the low point of the movie for me. Yeah. Because it just drags. And to be fair, Mm -hmm. the poppy scene kind of dragged. It did, but it wasn't nearly as bad. Yeah. It wasn't. This is the point where I increased it from 1.2 speed to 1.5 speed. (laughs) (laughs) And this is one of those scenes where so many of the songs, it's like, this is really great. It just goes on too long. This entire song is just not very good. No. I really think it would have been enough to have them start Garino saying, we'll never wear red wearing green. He says the new color's red. They do it as red. That's fine. Exactly. You don't need the gold. I just kept trying to think, does this like tie to the yellow brick road or no? They just, they needed a third first. I didn't even Mm. think of the traffic light connection until you mentioned it earlier. No. Well, and then that's what he has up on the towers is a gigantic traffic light, green, yellow, red. I completely missed it. Yeah. I didn't see that. It's an entire sequence that just disconnects you from the movie. Yeah. So I don't blame you. Yeah. So this is when they go and see the wizard for the first time where he's just a giant metal head. The giant (laughs) metal head of Richard Pryor. (laughs) God bless Richard Pryor. And we'll get more to him later on. But what do you think of the visual design of the sequence? I really liked it. I thought it was pretty cool looking. It was a nice kind of analog to the 39 film, but also its own thing. A giant shiny chrome Richard Pryor had a physically gigantic prop on set. Mm. And yeah, I love how it's just all angry and barking fire. It's the classic Wizard of Oz. How dare you? (laughs) I do kind of always love how Dorothy feels so terrible that she killed one person. Now she has to go kill someone. (laughs) This is the part where I checked out a little bit until we get to the final sequence. This whole everything is the weakest part of the movie. I understand. This is where it started to pull me back in. The way they end the scene where it's like they leave and you just start to push in on the giant chrome head and the tiny little face of Richard Pryor pops up in the eye socket. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) So from there we go to, it's just very ironic that a witch that cannot stand water being thrown on her is running a sweatshop that generates sweat. <laughs> it, like, it says it on the sign that it's producing sweat. It's like, wait, that would kill her. Why is she contributing to that? High risk, high reward. <laughs> <laughs> because maybe it can also kill her sisters. Mm. Stockpiling weapons. 
<laughs> hey, hey, uranium kills you, but people stockpile that. Ah. Yeah, no, I, I liked this. After being kind of uh, for a little while there, this did draw me back in a little bit. This whole little, I forget what the song is that they do. Don't give me no bad, bad news. news. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that was bringing the fun back because this was a fun sequence. Mm-hmm. Mabel King. She mm-hmm. again played this character on Broadway. And you can tell. Oh, man, is she you just... Can tell. Yeah. yeah. Not only her, but that costume, that gigantic dress, mm-hmm. and Stan Winston's ogre face that he gives her. She is just terrifying. She will just <laughs> snap you in half and make your children cry as they watch. Mm-hmm. She is a perfect Wicked Witch of the West. I do remember right around this time thinking like, I um, know they obviously wanted to be different, but in the 39 film, you feel the threat of the Wicked Witch very early. And in this one, they save her. Yeah, because they have the scene where she attacks them early on because she wants the slippers. Right. Whereas this, they save her to the end. And I'm thinking, man, she has such great charisma. She's such a wonderful villain. It's a shame that we're only seeing her now. Because then we would have a three hour movie. Well, no, actually, now that I think about it, though, that would have been a nice thing to do. Because you, again, you have the whole thing of the marionette guy following them around. Right. You right. could have done more of a play of showing her directly trying to manipulate manipulate the path of these characters and them constantly thwarting it yeah i mean because again you know the original film had the giant green globe that she was looking in and watching the situation and trying to make things happen which again wasn't really from the book no but i agree with you i think she could have been more of a presence no absolutely because man when she comes on she does not come on (laughs) she just leaves one hell of an impression and steals the show start strong finish strong yes and again she's only on screen for i want to say like six minutes total yeah it's a shame so how about them flying monkeys It's an interesting idea to make them a biker gang. (laughs) I liked the biker gang. The visuals of that part of it, that was really clever. Much like the Wicked Witch, they could have done more with them and I would have been perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. Whereas they just chased the heroes down and brought them in and that was it. That was the entire point of them being there. Right. The bikes with the wings was a really cool look. Yes. Yeah. What's interesting is when you have the wings, those are like giant fake bodies where the drivers are like buried in there and they're using hand puppets for the faces. Mm, But then like later in the movie when their bikes no longer have wings or just small motorcycles, that's when you have like full physical suits. I don't know why there was the sudden change. Yeah. I love that hand puppet of Cheeto, the leader of the flying monkeys. Just the weird twisted lips and everything is like, what? (laughs) No Bad News is definitely one of the better show numbers, but even that it's like verse, second full verse- yeah. Two minutes of dance sequence, third full verse. Yeah, man, so many times this thing had a way of like, oh, this is a great song. Oh, it's still going. Yeah. So then the flying monkeys attacking our heroes. Again, great use of location, just finding that empty, like, I don't know if it's like a parking structure or something. Or... It was like a parking garage, yeah. Scene goes on a little too long, mm-hmm. like, Every oh, scene. Tin Man stuck on an escalator. Tin Man's still stuck on an escalator. Well, now <laughs> he's on the other side, but he's stuck in the other direction. <laughs> Scarecrow found a place to hide. Now, Tin Man, join me in the place to hide. Now, Lion, join me in the place to hide. Oh, yeah. Now, Dorothy, join me in the place to hide. Toto, where's Toto? Toto, Toto, join us in the place to hide. Yeah. The staging is great, but just tighten up how you're staging it. Really, just have them cut straight to them going to the sweatshop. I don't know that we necessarily needed them to be captured and brought in since they were going to fight her anyway. I think you just, you needed some kind of a flying monkey sequence. Yeah, I guess so. It felt like the reverse of the Cowardly Lion. It's like, you gotta have the Cowardly mm-hmm. Lion, you gotta have the flying monkeys. So then we get another scene that I'm just gonna venture would have been horrifying as a child. It was. Of the scarecrow getting cut in half. It was. Yep. And the poor tin man being flattened. Yeah. I never understood how they reversed that. Yeah, that part. It's like, how did they fix that that fast? Yeah. They give him a new body. No, they don't. With the identical parts? That's the exact same body. Well, they're sweatshop workers. They're very good at what they do. It would be cool if they, like, cobbled together a new body from all the sewing machines. Yeah. But no, it's like somehow they use a crowbar, I think, because they like pass a giant crowbar and somehow that pops them back open. I mean, if they had gotten some bellows and like inflated them. Yeah. Not too far. I remember my old wife, Teeny. (laughs) No, I'm actually just thinking of like, instead of like watching the sewing machines melt, what if they just built them a new sewing machine body? (laughs) That would have been cool. Yeah. Just repurpose the sewing machines and make them a new body. Yeah. I'm a stitch. (laughs) But I think we're technically getting ahead, right? Yeah. (laughs) 
they're horribly wounded, the lion's being strung up by his tail, and then it is the scarecrow's brains that says, hey, go pull that fire switch. And again, this is all because the witch wants the silver slippers. Right. Which I remember, this was something that they also brought back was, Dorothy's told, never take them off until you get home. Mm -hmm. And so it's like everyone's trying to get her to take them off, including the wizard. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, Eveline melting into the giant toilet throne. (laughs) Into the toilet, yeah. That was an interesting choice. My childhood memory is that there was a flush sound, but there was no flush sound. <laughs> yeah, I thought I had remembered a flush sound too, but no, it was just literally down. Maybe that would have been the obvious route, just because we've seen this joke before. <laughs> <laughs> then we get another gigantic musical number of all the people freed from Eveline, literally mm. shedding their skins and becoming a beautiful troupe of black people. It's just celebrating the mm. beauty of black dancers. To be fair, the best song of the entire movie. I still think you can't win and no good news is better, but definitely one of the better of the dance productions. One of the most iconic. When people think of The Wiz, they think of this song. Well, no, they think of He's On Down the Road. That has not been my experience, but okay. It's Brand New Day, Brand right? New Day. Yeah, I feel like I've actually might have even heard that song before. In my experience, when people think of The Wiz, they think of Brand New Day. Poll for our listeners. <laughs> what song do you think of most yeah. when you think of The Wiz? I genuinely want to hear the comment sections are open. Shumacast.blogspot.com. Which I did hear that Ease On Down the Road was apparently released as a single. It was one of the chart toppers. Okay. Even before the movie. That was back when the play, yeah. Oh, gotcha. But once again, it just went on really long. Yeah. They had that whole ballet sequence. Which was cool. I do love the unzipping of the old bodies, the shedding of it, which again was a neat design and honestly a black fantasy film exploring the beauty of black dancers. I think it's a very powerful image. I think it's very beautiful. And again, it's just the simplicity of the dance, along with all of our heroes rejoicing as they're back on their journey and hello world, you know, that kind of thing. (laughs) Nipsey really busting a move. Everybody getting a verse, which was pretty great. Yeah. Well, four verses, plus I think another one leading up to that. So five verses. Yeah. And a big dance sequence. Yeah. It's long. Yep. So and then we go back to the Emerald City. Right. It was, I guess, once again, going back to the book. I almost expected him to say, I'm a humbug. (laughs) The way he kept going on, I'm a phony. (laughs) I liked that instead of a carnival man, he was a uh, politician. Yeah. That was, I thought, very thematically appropriate, especially since they moved everything to the city. He was running to be a neighborhood dog catcher. Yeah. Yeah. A failed politician, no less. (laughs) Whereas when you have a rural farming community, a carnival coming into town is a big deal. But when you're living in the city, a local alderman or a councilman is a really good change while keeping the intent of the original character. You're a huckster. You're a fraud. Mm-hmm. You're someone that says a lot of things to try to get a lot of people to like you. I thought that really worked. And in the original play, he was a traveling preacher and stump minister, mm. which, again, they never like thematically got into the religious angle, just that, you know, he's a traveling preacher. The idea is that ultimately he's a sort of leader figure. Sways the masses. Yep. Or tries to, and only succeeds when he comes up with a really gimmicky way to do it. <laughs> and again, the play, you know, the whole green glasses was a big part of it, as it was in the books. Right. I love Richard Pryor's performance in this scene. Just the desperation. Yeah, it's very good. Love Richard Pryor and everything he does. Every movie I've seen him in, I just love Richard Pryor. Oh, he's great. The whole, you can yell at me, you can call me names, you can tell me how awful I am, but just, I'm so lonely. Can you just talk to me for a few minutes? No, I know. Yeah. And it's funny, like, we've had two films in a row where it's the big Richard Pryor scene. Right. I think, your Car Wash was more like a typical cameo. Mm -hmm. This was a really good thematic scene in terms of, like, this is what happens when you go too far into just trying to live up to other people's expectations. Right. To the point where you just completely lost sense of who you are and what you want. But what's interesting is in the play, as in the 1930s movie and, and the musical, he still gives the three characters versions of like, here's a heart pendant to be your new heart. Here's <laughs> some all bran cereal, or is it all brain cereal? I'm going to pour in the old brain pan. Oh, Lord. I like that the <laughs> wizard doesn't give them anything. Dorothy is the right, one who's yes. like, you guys had this all along. I love that change. Yeah, that was perfect. And then Lena Horne shows up with some very uncomfortably looking suspended babies. <laughs> And some, I believe, Cabbage Patch dolls in the background. (laughs) That is a very interesting interpretation of the Glinda the Good Witch of the North. Yeah. Yeah. The Northern Lights, sort of? Not quite. I don't know what they were going for. I don't know where they were going with that. I think they were just kind of like spectacle. 
on paper, it was this beautiful thing of like, she's surrounded by this cosmos of youth. That's not what you delivered. No. I love a lot of the mad effects in this movie. That is one of the weaker ones. Yeah. yeah. The sequence and the last sequence, I completely spaced out during. I don't know what that says more about me or about the actual sequence itself. Right. Bless her, Lena Horne. It's just so weird. You know, Glinda comes in all calm and soothing and ethereal. And then she starts singing and she's belting it out. She is just really, <laughs> really selling it. It's like, well, that's a great performance, but man, was that a character shift. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, I really love where Dorothy's finally clicking her heels and she's singing the song Home, which I know was also a big hit song from the musical. I love how they stage it, how it's just a close up of Diana Ross looking straight at the camera as she's just in one single take pouring out such an emotional song as the memories of the journey start to flash by behind her. But again, it just goes on too long. Way too long. Yeah. Except when you're watching it at two times speed, then it's great. <laughs> I don't think that counts. It's probably our biggest criticism of the entire thing, even though we found some new picks, it's just the pacing. Yeah. Pacing. I want to chalk this up to... Sidney Lumet was an absolutely fantastic director, a legendary director, an experienced director. But again, this was him doing something he'd never done before. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot. He never tried it again. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many elements that work in this movie, but the underlying pace is such a constant flaw. Like, I don't think there's a single scene that does not have a pacing issue. Probably not. I mean, even like the quickest scene is the flying monkeys and even that. Mm-hmm. I don't even have a problem with just how big and elaborate and over the top all the production is in terms of the sets and costumes and the scales. Also. That was fine. Yeah. That never felt like, you know, as we'll get to in like Batman and Robin, it never felt like that got away from them. Mm -hmm. But it's just the pacing. They just didn't know how to pace it. Yeah, you're just lingering on it way too long. And I'll be honest, I think the movie that this most reminds me of is, did you guys ever see that Robin Williams Popeye movie? Yes. Yes. Many times. This reminds me a lot of that, where it's a big, elaborate production. I love the cast. I love the designs. The music isn't great, but it kind of works. But everything is just so drawn out. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy to just drift away from it. Even though they're mm -hmm. showing you a great spectacle and all this stuff, it's hard to drum up the fun and the enthusiasm for it. It's a good right. movie to have on TV while you're at your grandparents' house on a Christmas morning and yeah. it's going on and people are enjoying the songs as it happens and during the long draggy parts, people are talking. And That's when they're catching up with their friends. Yeah. 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 It's a good movie yeah. to have on in the background where you occasionally focus in on the good parts. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I remember it and that's how I'm going to continue to remember it. So any final thoughts before I go on for another half hour? <laughs> no. All right. The play. The Book of the Wiz was written by William F. Brown with music and lyrics by Charlie Smalls. William F. Brown, as we mentioned, a white man, he was a cartoonist, novelist, television writer, and playwright whose other shows include The Girl in the Freudian Slip, How to Steal an Election, and a Broadway musical titled A Broadway Musical. I haven't seen any of his other stuff. I know he wrote for a bunch of TV shows in the 70s and stuff, but not really anything I'm familiar with. And then mm -hmm. Charlie Smalls. Now, I know I sent both of you a clip of Charlie Smalls from The Monkey Show. Yes, I watched it. That's one of the few images of him that's out there online. He never really released any albums. He was a musician and a songwriter and would often mm -hmm. just play in traveling jazz bands, often like the band accompaniment to other acts. Mm -hmm. And this was like his one big thing, doing the songs for The Wiz. And again, remember, The Wiz, when it started, was just actually a really small production in Baltimore, Maryland. It was not a massive Broadway play. It was just this kind of small production. No one really expected much of it. Sadly, Charlie Smalls didn't live much longer. He died at age 43 of a burst appendix. Yeah, I saw that. Because I think he was even working on something else and he never got to finish it. Miracles, yeah. That was another yeah. play he was doing. It's a shame. The Wiz first opened in Baltimore in October 21st, 1973, and it only took three months before it was picked up and moved to the Majestic Theater on Broadway with an entirely replaced cast. The show was almost canceled in its first week because it got a whole bunch of bad reviews and maybe half the seats were filled. Mm. It was a failure, but 20th Century Fox, who was hoping to get the film rights, had sunk $100,000 into it. So they mm. were like, you got to keep it going at least just a little bit longer. So that's when they decided to release Ease On Down the Road as a single. Oh, okay. And it suddenly became a chart-topping success. They released a TV commercial, which I sadly can't find, of the song advertising the musical. And by its eighth week, every night was selling out. 
the show moved to the actual Broadway theater on Broadway in 1977, and the entire show kept going until 1979. So it ran for four years and 1,672 performances. And to this day, still goes through tons of revivals and tours. And in 1975, won seven Tony Awards for Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Direction, Choreography, Costume Design, and Overall Best Musical, and was also nominated for the Best Script, but it lost out to the writers of Shenandoah. And we all remember Shenandoah, don't we? Exactly. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> memorable name, but that's yes. about it. <laughs> So the film rights were picked up by Barry Gordy. Now, Angie, have you ever heard the name Barry Gordy before? Yes. Why do I know that? Do you remember when we covered Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Barry Gordy, pretty much the king of Motown. Yeah, he was the creator of Motown Records. Okay, yeah. In the 70s is when they started moving into film production. They had a decent run. This was their fifth film. The Last Dragon was actually their last film that they ever made before they folded up that side. Mm. So initially, the director of this film was going to be John Badham. Do you guys recognize that name? No. Yes, I'm too tired to place them, but I definitely know that name. <laughs> In the 80s, he did some classics you may have heard of, Blue Thunder, War Games, and Short Circuit. Okay, okay, yeah. He had worked as a TV director for a while, but in the 70s, he had just broken out with the Bingo Long Traveling All-Star and Motor Kings. And right before this, and this is the film that led him to get this role, was he directed Saturday Night Fever, the disco movie. Okay, that makes sense. And he was all set to do it. And again, they were going to cast a new young actor. And then that's when Diana Ross entered the picture. Mm. John Baden didn't want to completely change the script. Barry Gordy surprisingly didn't want to, even though Barry Gordy not only had a daughter with Diana Ross and was still great friends with her and produced her last two movies, was skeptical of casting Diana Ross. Hmm. This is when Rob Cohen enters the picture. Now, have either of you heard the name Rob Cohen? Vaguely. Rob Cohen was a producer at the time, this young up-and-comer. I think he was still in his late 20s at the time. Between the 70s and 80s, produced stuff like Legend of Billie Jean, The Witches of Eastwick, Monster Squad, and The Running Man. And then in the 90s, started directing. And here's some films that might sound familiar. Dragonheart, mm. Dragon the Bruce Lee Story, Fast and the Furious, Triple X, The Legendary Stealth, and The Mummy 3 Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Okay. He was the one who stepped in and championed Diana Ross. He's the one who brought in Sidney Lumet. He's the one who started pushing the new direction of the script. So this is technically a genuine collaboration between Joel Schumacher and Rob Cohen, hmm. the directors of Stealth and Batman and Robin, <laughs> the collaboration you never knew existed. <laughs> and then, of course, Sidney Lumet came in and all that stuff happened. I have a chunk of quotes here from Joel Schumacher. After Sparkle and Car Wash, I was kind of the quote-unquote black writer. <laughs> and Sidney Lumet, who had distinguished himself not by doing musicals, asked me to do The Wiz and offered me a lot of money. I saw the play and it was so magical that I didn't think I could do anything with it at all. I said no a hundred times. Then everybody said, are you crazy? You have to do this movie. And I thought there might have been something wrong with me. I said yes and <laughs> flew to New York and we were going to fly in some eight-year-old girl who was an unknown to play Dorothy. And we got off the plane and Sydney said, I've got the greatest news in the world. Diana Ross is going to be playing Dorothy. <laughs> Not to be disrespectful to Diana Ross, but suddenly Dorothy was a middle-aged spinster school teacher in Manhattan and Oz was Manhattan. You know, Sydney was such a New Yorker and New York was one of the stars in the movie. Well, I hadn't planned on any of that, nor was the play like that at all. I played catch up the rest of the film and I tried to roll with the punches the best I could. I have great respect for Sydney. He's made some extraordinary films. I'm not so sure musical fantasy is his bag. <laughs> but it was a great experience for me, and I learned a lot. I think whenever you take on Wizard of Oz, you're dealing with the Holy Grail, but none of those were my choices. I always knew that it was way beyond me. I always knew that I was the tiniest cog in the wheel. It was going to cost $8 million, and then suddenly it went up to $30 million. It seems very overproduced. I think everybody worked their asses off. The movie is so loaded with talent. I think that it was historic. I don't think any African-American film had been made at that budget. And I think at the time, Sydney was the only one who could have made that happen. I never thought that I totally got my ass in that seat because the direction of it had changed so much. But the movie is so beloved, especially in the African-American community. Everybody grew up on it. Everybody's kids love it. And I think that's true of some of the Caucasian community, too. I mean, it's quite a fascinating film visually, and it does have Michael Jackson at that age and will be forever preserved. I'm still friends with Quincy Jones to this day. Michael and I stayed in contact for many years. He was always trying to get me to do a music video or put him in a movie. And that's all I got. Apparently, Michael was really trying to get Joel to direct the music video for Scream. That would be fun. 
So anyways, that's Joel Schumacher's say on the movie. I mean, it's interesting. Again, it's interesting where it's like, given what we've been through so far and then knowing where Joel's career goes, it's like, right. I thought this was a lot more Joel Schumacher than it actually was. Yeah, I mean, like I assumed, because it sounds kind of like from those quotes that they told him, put it in New York. Yeah, I think he was just a writer for hire that they were just kind of throwing ideas at and he just kind of had to make sense of it all. Right. I would imagine the fact, knowing that he grew up there, he had a lot more to draw from than someone who didn't, you know, someone from L.A. would not have had the same influence mm -hmm. on that kind of adaptation. On paper, I thought the script read beautifully. Okay. Again, you didn't have the pacing issues. And I think he just has really good lush descriptions of all these ideas and concepts and everything. And seeing a lot of that brought to screen was really neat. But again, just the pacing mm -hmm. was not something that was an issue on paper. I thought, you know, his his writing was good in this. I thought his dialogue was good, the themes that he brought in, the characters. Again, we have some quibbles about like how the line is used and some plot threads here and there, but for the most part, I think it's good writing. Yeah, it's the kind of thing where maybe a modern adaptation of this that would somehow find a way to tighten some of those things up, maybe lessen the lion's importance and so forth, would be a really great thing to do. There are a lot of things happening in the world these days where a adaptation to modern time could be in its favor. Absolutely. Yeah. I would like to see something else do this with, again, a fantasy fairy tale set in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. I just think overall, we haven't really seen much of that. I'm kind of surprised urban fantasy hasn't gone on much except for like of the Twilight ilk. You know? There's a, if this is your kind of thing, and I'm going to say this to listeners as well, the 90s BBC production miniseries of Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere is still one of the mm. absolute best. And it's exactly this kind of thing. And I still need to check mm. out American Gods, which I hear is a similar ilk. I've heard good things about it. I've read the original book. Yeah, I haven't watched that one yet. I would honestly be curious to learn, are there more stories from a black perspective that are like this? Because again, I, I haven't really explored much yeah. urban fantasy for writers of color. You'd think there would have to be. I mean, listeners, if you know of any like interesting films or, or books similar in vibe and concept to what they're doing here with The Wiz, I, I would be curious to learn. G give us some recommends. I will say, take a look at the works of Tennessee Coates, mm. uh, Ava DuVernay. Oh, speaking of, I'm looking forward to seeing how the new Wrinkle in Time. Wrinkle in Time. But yeah, Ava DuVernay. Mm. There are a lot of writers that have had runs on Marvel's Black Panther since the 80s that have gone on to do their own stuff, that there's a lot of really good stuff out there that I am obviously far too white to uh, really say is the black experience in sci-fi fantasy, but I would definitely recommend checking stuff like that out. So as Joel mentioned, the budget kind of ballooned up. I've kind of seen conflicting reports as to whether it was $24 million or $34 million. The film was released on October 24th, 1978. Guess what came out on October 25th, 1978? Star Wars? I think that was no. 77. No, that would be 77. 1978. <laughs> John Carpenter's Halloween. Okay, there you go. <laughs> And guess which one became the big hit of the season? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, The Wiz still did pretty well. I mean, it did $21 million, but I think the problem was is that it went so far over budget. Mm. If they had kept it a little more streamlined, a little simpler, like maybe made the dance sequences a little less elaborate, <laughs> I think it would have been more successful. And also, I think the pacing would have made it easier to watch. But I mean, the film has definitely had a cult following. I like that it's become more popular over the years, even though it's always still kind of a mixed popularity. And I think, again, a lot of that's just, it's not the easiest film to watch because of the pace. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even looking like not much else is coming out in, like in November is when you get like Watership Down, which would have been popular among certain audiences. And Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings, which wasn't <laughs> competition at all. <laughs> no. And then you get to December and that's when The Deer Hunter and Superman came out. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, movies played in theaters a lot longer back then. By the time Superman comes out, you're kind of done. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what happened to Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Ice Castles. <laughs> so, I mean, that's really all I have on release. So just kind of moving us into our final section. One interesting thing is that they did almost do a remake. There was an attempt first by Fox and then by Disney and then jointly by Fox and Disney to do a remake in the late 90s, early 2000s. That film ultimately never happened and the rights kind of got lost. But what happened was the Muppets Wizard of Oz grew mm. out of that production. So a mm. lot of like the design work and sets and costumes that they were planning to do for a new version of Wiz ended up being used for the Muppets. 
Have you ever seen the Muppets version? I think I watched it when it first came out. No, I didn't. It still starred Ashanti, who was actually in talks to star in the Wiz version as Dorothy. But I know the actual remake that they were planning was going to star Queen Latifah, Patti LaBelle, Busta Rhymes, and Little Richard. Wow, that's a cast. That's a cast. And at least one of those still stuck around. Because in like <laughs> the last few years, it's become popular doing those live restagings of classic plays. Mm -hmm. Started with Sound of Music and then went to Peter Pan. And this was the third one where in 2015, NBC did a live staging of The Wiz. The NBC live performance is actually not the play. It's closer to the play. It does follow the play better, but they still had a brand new script where they just went in and rewrote most of the dialogue, which to be fair, the dialogue in the play, it was very simplistic. There wasn't much of anything to it. So I think mm -hmm. they actually improved it. The script was written by a white man. <laughs> Someone you may have heard of, Harvey Fierstein. Mm, I don't think I know that. I'm sure you've seen Mrs. Doubtfire, right? Oh, yeah. Remember yeah. how he has the gay brother makeup designer brother? Oh, yeah. Who is that very funny guy with a beard and a very deep, gravelly voice? Yes, yes. That's Harvey Fierstein. He's done a lot of stuff. He was pretty heavily involved in Hairspray. When they did the live version of Hairspray on TV, he still played the divine role because he's been playing that role on Broadway for years. Yes. He's been in Broadway since the 70s. He's been around for a long time. He's a very big writer and producer. He's all hat. Yeah. And again, he's a character actor. He was also in Independence Day. You know, he was the boss of the Jeff Goldwyn character. You know, he's a funny guy you see pop up all the time. I think they went with him because he also did the Sound of Music and Peter Pan adaptations. Makes sense. The NBC Live version of this, I did watch. It's very good. It's very fun. I think it's the best staging of the play I've seen, mostly because it does add some new elements of the dialogue. In that one, it's more Dorothy still trying to find where home is for her because she was thrust into this new life against her will when her parents died. And so she's like, I need to get home. But where's home? I don't know. Her home is the town where her parents are from, but her parents are no longer there. You know? Yeah. It's a very, very good adaptation. Of the cast, again, The Lion is probably the most level this time is David Allen Greer. Yeah. Oh, he's great as The Lion. And they got Queen Latifah as The Wizard. She's great. Mary J. Blige as Eveline. It's very good. I think it's a very good adaptation. But because it goes back to the play, it's again, Kansas and farmlands right. and fields. And it doesn't have the urban element of the movie. It's just a more straight adaptation of Wizard of Oz. Yeah. I like that because I kind of like having both of them. That's a great representation of what The Wiz was meant to be. And then you have the film version, which is like taking that in a whole different angle. It's hard for me to pick between the two because I really enjoyed aspects of both. I think the TV version, it moves at a much better pace. Even though it's literally filmed on a stage, it's like Cirque du Soleil doing all the big dance numbers with a lot of acrobatics and everything. It's a very, very beautiful production. And they had to pace for commercial breaks and everything, too. Things had to be cut down by nature of that. They didn't really cut anything down, but you definitely do have the, you know, let's end the scene, fade to black. Here's where the commercial would be, you know, and now we open up on a new set. Mm. They're kind of using the commercials where a play would typically have the uh, scene breaks. It's just the film, I think, is just so inventive in its use of the urban angle and the design yeah. elements and the costumes. And again, the performances and the themes that it has, too. I don't really want to pick between the two. I kind of like having them coexist. It'd be nice to have like a further whiz entry that pulls together the best of both. Right, right. The suburban whiz. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, any final thoughts kind of wrapping up the whiz experience? Like I said, it's very visually dynamic. I really do like a lot of the stuff that they did. It was like going back to the early 90s and being in that living room again with, you know, my aunts and uncles talking about usually teaching because half my family are teachers. And then, hey, that's Michael Jackson. Look, it's Michael Jackson. Hey, it's Diana Ross. Look, it's Diana Ross. And just I felt like a kid again watching this. And that's really what you want out of this kind of a thing to have that connection to that. And I definitely have that. It has its flaws, but ultimately, it's familiar in the fact that it is what it is. And that's to its credit. Angie? I said I don't recommend it, but I will say if you're listening to this, if you haven't seen it before, if you're on the fence, go ahead and check it out. Go into it expecting that slow pace. I'd say it's kind of like Star Trek The Motion Picture. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> that movie, if you fast forward through some of those scenes, you get what you need out of it. <laughs> You're not missing right? anything. Yeah. It's a great movie. There's just too much of it. Exactly. Like, I feel like this is kind of the same thing. So whether you decide to just look up some major clips on YouTube, because you definitely want to hear Diana Ross and you want to see Michael Jackson and Nipsey Russell. And, I mean, really, everyone's performance is really great in this. Listen to the soundtrack. 
by the soundtrack yeah. on, on iTunes or something. There's a lot of good, and I feel bad not recommending it. It's just, yeah, it's got some flaws in that pacing, that's all. Yeah. It's been a fascinating journey just going through all the various stages of The Wiz like I did. And there's definitely something there. It's a powerful and necessary thing for other cultures to have like their version of a thing. You know, this kind of goes back to why I always like remakes of I like variances. I like other people doing their own spin on a thing. What's been interesting is how much of the whiz has come from white people. But still, it's a thing that I'm glad exists. It's a thing that I'm glad people keep playing on and have done so many interpretations of and spins of. I mean, like Wizard of Oz itself has had so many countless variants and interpretations. Oh, yeah. And, one thing we forgot to mention is Tin Man, you know, that TV miniseries they did, which again was mm -hmm. kind of a more right. steampunk, modern aesthetic, urban fantasy type thing. But even Tin Man is a lot like this. Great designs, great ideas, great cast. The pacing is awful. Mm -hmm. There's so many great variants on The Wizard of Oz. It's cool seeing that The Wiz, its own branch of The Wizard of Oz, that itself has had so many variants. As I said, there's so many different full stagings available on YouTube. If you even just go back and look at photos of the original Baltimore show and the original Broadway show, there's just a huge world of difference between the costumes and the sets and the cast and everything. There's so much variety you can have to play with it. And that's why I kind of like, again, I like having the NBC version, which is just going pure fairy tale. And then the 78 version was like, let's just go like full on ultra detailed urban fantasy fairy tale and how you have just these two completely different takes on the same material. I like having things like that, even though it's a very flawed movie. I like that The Wiz is in public consciousness as its own thing. I like that it's part of the pop culture. Yeah. Yeah. And that it's been around and that it's still aired on TV regularly. People still check it out or at least check out parts of it. It's something people are still aware of, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. To the point where the play still gets put on. The people still look up sequences from it. People know what The Wiz is. The song Brand New Day is used in a whole bunch of different things. There's the Six Flags Fright Fest, one of their seasonal musicals that they do every year. They finish out with Brand New Day from The Wiz, and it's a great closing number for very many reasons. It's a song that has persisted in the public consciousness, and I really appreciate that as well. In my love of remakes and reboots, there are like certain stories that I think should be retold for each generation. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, I think Wizard of Oz is one of them itself. But I would like to see a new version of The Wiz every 30 years. Just see what each new generation would do with it. Just the fact that it's its own thing, even though it's specifically derivative of something else, is in itself kind of amazing. Again, that's where derivative is not a bad thing. It's just what something is. Everything's derivative of something. Yeah. It derives <laughs> yeah. from this. Right. And that's our latest statement on I Hate Love Remakes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one last thing to say, and you can cut this if you want, but I just wanted to say Lindsay Ellis did a fantastic entry in her Loose Cannon series about the Wicked Witch of the West, in which she also brings up Eveline from The Wiz, and it's definitely worth checking out. So I think that wraps up this episode of Shumacast. Thank you for joining us, Kevin. Oh, thank you once again for having me on your various things, and I look forward to the next time that you guys bring me on. And Angie, I think it's time for us to ease on down the road. Yes. <laughs> and go ease to sleep. On down, ease on down, yes. <laughs> ease on down into my bed. Yeah. Yes. So good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. 